Shalom, Gideon Ariel here, together with uh, Bob O'Dell behind the camera. He'll be uh, piping in from time to time, perhaps. We're here today in Jerusalem, in uh, the beautiful neighborhood of Mount Scopus, meeting with Claire Fan, the academic dean of the University of the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll first of all like to uh, hear about you and about the university, if you could uh, tell us in, as they say, uh, 60 seconds, but you can take yeah, a little bit longer. Yeah, <laughs> say the feet sore, it's short. Well, my husband and I are from San Jose, California. We studied in Berkeley at the Graduate Theological Union before we came to Israel in 1982 for one year at the Hebrew University. That was a long year. That was a long year and a <laughs> wonderful year, and that year really transformed our lives. So my husband subsequently did his PhD at Hebrew University, and in the course of that time, we started a school which is just a crazy, crazy idea. But my husband, together with other Christian doctoral students and scholars who were studying at Hebrew University, immediately saw the value of Christians coming to Israel to understand better the Jewish backgrounds of the New Testament. And so we founded the University of the Holy Land, which is a school that offers graduate education um, to international Christians, from many, many different denominational backgrounds. And where is it located? Our offices are in Gilo, but our courses are taught here on Mount Scopus, primarily in the international school, the Rothberg International School, because we have a sister school relationship with them. Exactly. So we're here in Jerusalem. And how many students do you have today? Well, in graduate education, of course, your numbers are going to be smaller, but usually we have between 60 and 90 students doing degree programs. Mm. And then we offer short-term programs, which bring in another 100 or so every year. Okay, and uh, people can, let's uh, cut to the chase, how can people apply? <laughs> <laughs> well, nowadays, of course, it's a new generation. Everybody goes to, to the website, yes. website <laughs> www.uhl.ac. And everything can be done online to communicate okay. with our office, see our programs, and uh, find out about our courses. Well, jot, that, that, jot that down now, because by the end of this segment, I think you're all going to want to go there. But <laughs> stick around for the segment. What's the profile of the students? Age range and where, yes. what countries they come from? The, the demography of the students has changed considerably over the years. But currently, in the, in the 2000s, we are half Western and half Asian. Because in the last 15 years or so, there's been a real wave of interest from Korean Christians, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, well, Thailand, Japan. Philippines? To, Philippines, yes. To study also the backgrounds of their faith and to come here. And of course, um, as I said, we're interdenominational. The primarily our student body is evangelical, but the range has been all the way from high church with Polish Orthodox and Coptic to uh, the, the broadest range of charismatic as well. So the wonderful thing about studying here is that the Bible becomes the grounding focus, and that's pre-denominational. The Bible belongs to all Christians, and in this context, they get to explore the Bible in its own setting. So it's something where you can set, you can set back or or set aside denominational statements and just look at scripture. That's, that's just fantastic. I think that there is really a trend nowadays of people wanting to go beneath all the veneer that uh, they've come to know and uh, they've been come to make feel that this is what it really is, but if they dig a little bit deeper and it's right there for them in the, in the scripture itself. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. I say sometimes that when my husband and I came here in 1982, it was like walking into Disneyland in the most positive sense. Everywhere you turned, there was something that made Scripture come alive, whether it was hearing and living in the Hebrew language or having archaeological sites you know, surrounding you, the weather, the topography, the calendar. Imagine stepping out of America into a calendar that is driven by the Jewish holidays, which of course you did because you lived I, I have to say that when I came to Israel, I would sign every word that you just said. I felt that uh, as a Jewish person, for me to come to Israel and uh, be, I like to say, a, a player in, in this uh, scene, in this act, and not just a, uh, a spectator, 
Yes. And that's really something that we have in common, isn't it? Absolutely. It's First of all, to step out of our Western Christian calendar and step into the calendar of Jesus, is tr- it's very transformative. It also allows us the privilege of living as a minority for us Gentile Christians who are here because our Jewish friends have always lived as a minority in the United States and had to make an effort to celebrate the Hagim or the feasts. Mm -hmm. In this context, the Christians have the privilege of living out the reverse. We get to celebrate the feasts of Israel with Israel and enjoy the Passover and enjoy Shavuot and enjoy the Feast of Tabernacles and enjoy enjoy the Shabbat. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Turn off the computer, (laughs) unplug the phone, um, which is really wonderful and healthy. You do that? You you go... I try not to check my email. I'll answer the phone. (laughs) Because I'm at the head of the institution, I have to be available to students. But I I don't check my email on Shabbat because it's just too much. Good for you. Yeah. (laughs) But um, to get to live as a minority also is a privilege. It's, it's a very broadening and, and enlightening experience. And then to have to choose from, to, to celebrate our Christian feasts of Christmas and Easter, the resurrection, without all the commercialism, <laughs> with all, all of the hoopla and the pressure, and to try to really experience meaningfully in context those feasts is an extremely privileged and wonderful And that's something you can only get here and now. That's right. Fantastic. And then, to you know, for me, another one of the amazing things that coming to Israel taught me was, um, you know, I had this kind of simplistic view of Jews and Judaism. I thought that all Jews thought alike and all Jews practiced alike, which was so naive. And then to come to Israel and actually meet Jewish people and learn the diversity, which is staggering. I, of course, for every Jew, there's an opinion or two. That's what they so, say. That's what they say. But to have, have Jewish people become real friends and open my eyes to understand context in Scripture, like how to have a meal together, um, which was an issue in the time that the New Testament was written as well, when you had a a congregation in which there were both Jewish followers of Jesus and Gentile followers of Jesus, and they wanted to have a a meal together. I mean, this was a big issue. Paul writes about this twice in 1 Corinthians and in Romans. And what is his advice? How do you have a meal for people who keep kosher and people who don't keep kosher? And, and he, Sounds like it's right off the internet. It is, it is, it's so relevant because we live it here all the time, and it's right. it's a tricky thing to to be aware of, you know, respecting other traditions. So Paul can get very practical. He can give really, you know, sound practical advice for how to carry this out. This sounds like something like a, a perspective that you encourage and teach at your institution. Yes. How minute do you think this perspective is amongst all of Christian Christendom? I, I wish, my <sighs> heart's desire is that people who are considering any type of ministry career, whether it's teaching or pastoring, would make their first serious trip to Israel at the beginning of their career, at the beginning of their studies, before they step into the pulpit. Because I really think the safeguard for interpreting scripture honestly and in context is to spend a little period of time. It could be a three-week intensive program, which can give a wonderful grounding, or it could be a year abroad or doing a graduate degree or even continuing education. But most Christians reward themselves at the end of their career with their visit to Israel, like that's the prize. And now they're 50, 60, or 70, and they're retiring, and they get to go to Israel. But think of what the results would be if people would come here at the beginning. They would see that Jerusalem is in the mountains, that it's not in the desert like all the movies show them. They could go to some place like Nazareth Village, which is a historic museum, and see a 3D life-size synagogue replica or how farming was carried out in the time of Jesus. Those kinds of experiences open up... Or they could cross the street to the... Uh, to the Jewish community and see a real active synagogue and a real active agricultural community. Absolutely. And then (laughs) 
Then the words of the Hebrew prophets in the Old Testament and the words of Lord. Jesus come alive yes, because they use this imagery all the time. They talk about the natural setting, etc. I, what I was really, uh, that, that's beautiful, but, uh, and I agree with it 100%. I was thinking more along this idea of the relationship with the real Jews of the 21st century, of the mutual respect that uh, you're talking about, that, that we are, are here acting on, like you're, you are who you are, and I am who I am, and that's okay. And we can have a uh, fair relationship and find those things that we have in common. Yes, you know, when we came here in 1982, we didn't think we were going to live here. <laughs> it, was, it was an unfolding plan. And then he's, my husband started school, and then we had our children. And for us, the, the question, you know, was if we're here long term, what would be the educational choices for our kids? Because yes. they are not citizens, it's not a birthright mm. country, but they are growing up here as uh, residents. Yeah. So they went to... They went to daycare, Ma'on, then they went to Gan, kindergarten. We knew that they needed to be fully integrated and matriculated in the Israeli public school system in order to be part of society here. Right. And um, so they studied in Hebrew their whole lives, and now they're grown-ups and did their degrees and are doing one, one last one is doing degrees at Hebrew University. But throughout that experience, we never had any any prejudice we didn't ever have any negative experience you felt no negative experiences we felt no negative experiences they were embraced in their schools their teachers loved them they have lifelong friendships that go back to their childhood and um, and it's been it, it's been a situation where it's life is hard in Israel and you have to everybody has to work with the ministry of the interior which is not an easy <laughs> office to work with and you have to be scrappy and plucky, but... Chutzpah, I think. Yeah, it takes chutzpah. Right? There you go. It <laughs> takes chutzpah. But our relationships with our Jewish friends and neighbors and with the institutions of government as a whole has been very positive. Yeah, the, it's just uh, really, it's something that not too many people know about. People think... Israelis think that Israel is their next door neighbor and who, and the Hebrew speaking actors on TV. Yeah. But the idea that there are so many minorities to use the the term that you used pre previously, but uh there we can, we can respect each other and you that like I said before you are who you are and I am who I am and that there's no danger in that to either of us mm -hmm. is something that that uh People who uh, I'm finding in my own Jewish community that uh, they're far from that. Mm -hmm. uh, many Orthodox Jews are still oh Christians. That's that's a, a, a red flag word. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you say okay, they're Christians, fine. But they're people, <laughs> and they're nice people. Just just be nice together and and yes. focus on the things that you have in common. That's that's the. The phrase that I keep on repeating in Root Source, and uh, I'm glad to hear that there's uh, other organizations uh, much uh, older than, than Root Source that are promoting that also amongst the Christian community that they are reaching. Yes, and part of the rationale of our school uh, came as a result of us studying at Hebrew University. We realized that most international Christians wouldn't have enough time to learn modern Hebrew to study well mm -hmm. with the Hebrew University professors. But of course, all the professors speak English. Mm -hmm. So we decided to design a curriculum that would hire the experts from Hebrew University and other institutes in the, in the city to teach their area of expertise in English so that the international student would get mm. the best return for their investment of time and money, but they would be studying with Jewish scholars because even the approach to scripture and the kinds of questions that Jewish scholars ask are different than the kinds of questions that Christian scholars ask, and it broadens our understanding to be able to study with some of the most eminent minds who write the textbooks. <laughs> you and I hear that phrase, the, that the Jewish scholars have different questions, they approach it differently, and we both smile and say, wow, something different to learn. And I'm wondering how many Christians, and also on the other side of the fence, Jews, and that, in, in, uh, in, on the flip side, would say, well, it's different. Well, that's not good. I want to focus on my way of doing things and not this other way of doing it. And, and 
we see that it's just the opposite. As you said, it enriches you to hear. You by by studying something doesn't mean that you are closing everything else off and and what you knew before. No, <laughs> one of my favorite phrases that I've learned from my Jewish friends is "70 faces has the Torah," mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which which is uh, a, it's a statement that means we can keep looking at Scripture. We can keep looking at from many angles, and it's not a threatening thing when we find another level of understanding or a different angle to come in. Seventy faces has the Torah. We don't have to be rigid, and we can be open to looking at this deep and wonderful resource. I'm just making a connection here, and I'm a little goosebumps coming on over here. Uh, I'm, of course, familiar, very familiar with that with that term of 70 faces have, uh, the, the Torah has 70 facets. Mm-hmm. But uh, we are recording this during a week that uh, the number 70 has another uh, connotation. Oh. And that is the 70 nations that are meeting in, fr- in Paris, uh, uh, from our perspective, from my perspective, from what, I, what I'm following in the news, to uh, go against Israel, to go against the Jewish people and, and the, the land of Israel. But the idea of 70 nations is not only from that uh, uh, end times Armageddon type scenario, it also comes from, uh, it comes to mind the 70 uh, bulls that were sacrificed during the uh, holiday of tabernacles, of Sukkot. Mm-hmm. And Jewish tradition teaches that these 70 sacrifices were for the 70 nations. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking now that this 70 facets, why the number 70? You could have taken any arbitrary large number. Perhaps this is one of those 70 faces that the 70 facets of Torah, the reason that that phrase was used is to awaken the Jewish scholars, say, you know, some of those facets also come from the nations. Oh, it's very interesting. interesting. Yeah, yes. very, very interesting to think about. Yes. I- I have a question for you, uh, Claire. Uh, many of our root source viewers uh, want to come to Israel, certainly as a, either have been or, or want to come. Um, but for those that would come to the University of Holy Land, that is an extra level of commitment. And, and I'm wondering if you could put yourself in the heart uh, of, of students that make that decision to come. What, what, what is that define? Is there a defining thing that's inside them that what what is it that is is causing them to to take this extraordinary step of coming and living and studying yes it's not an easy thing to leave your home and your family for a year or two if you're coming to do a degree and it does take a real sense of calling Um, our students certainly love israel and want to be in israel and they want to understand Jesus is in his Jewish setting. And, and the, the, they know that Israel is a classroom. I mean, the country is a classroom. The people is a classroom. The language is part of a classroom. Um, to better understand scripture, they want to, to read it in context. And it, the beauty of that is that, it, you know, against a very sometimes skeptical academic approach to scripture, the more time you spend here, the more you realize that there is historic authenticity in the New Testament and in the Hebrew Bible, that there's a context that is real. And the, the books that made it into the New Testament made it in because they reflected Jewish context, Jewish life. The non-canonical Gospels, the Gospels that didn't make it into the New Testament, were far hmm. afield from what the early church understood to be this genuine thing. So we even think about fun things like, we know that in when uh, a Jewish woman is pregnant, you don't ask the name because the name of the baby is announced at the circumcision. Really? So it's not really good etiquette to say, have you picked out a name for the baby yet? Did you know that in both the case of John the Baptist and Jesus, their names were not announced until the circumcision, sorry, both of them were circumcised on the eighth day, and then their names were announced, which is still the practice today. Yes. And that they paid the redemption price of the firstborn for yes. Jesus. Mary did the purification offering. And that entire story of the nativity in the Gospel of Luke is a story of Jewish community. It's a story of joy and rejoicing. It's not a sad story. There's no you know, rain and the donkey on December 24th or anything. We are looking at a reflection of Jewish 
life, Jewish religious life, Jewish family life, and community and hospitality and joy and fulfillment of promises. And, and it's a happy, happy story. But unless you really understand that those practices of circumcision on the eighth day and announcing the name are part of Jewish practice for thousands of years, you don't get it. One last question, at least for me. It seems to us that there's been uh, an increase, even like a groundswell of interest in exploring Jewish roots mm -hmm. from, from Christians. You started back in 82, so you've mm -hmm. seen it. Is there something, a trend here? Do you, how, do you, how do you see that? I think that the real exploration of Jewish roots began after the Holocaust. And the, the Christian world at large said Jesus would have gone into the gas chambers. Mm. He would have died as a Jew. Mm. And what is wrong with us as Christians that we allow this to happen? Mm. And so even beginning within the Catholic Church there, mm. and in Protestant high churches, a new emphasis was placed on understanding Jesus in his Jewish context in the Jewish backgrounds of Christianity. Um, there had been a little bit before World War II, but it's after World War II. And, and that has trickled down now. It has produced wonderful scholars, tremendous research, and it continues to trickle down now from the higher levels of academia into the experience of the common man. And, and it's something that is accessible. It's accessible for Christians everywhere to come for two or three weeks and just study cultural and historical backgrounds is life-changing. It's life-changing. And to, if you really want to be a teacher or a preacher, to come and spend a year or more is life-changing. But um, so you're saying the seeds of the movement that we see now, those seeds were planted in the darkest time. Yes, as a result of the darkest time. That's exactly the, the you know, one positive fruit, I think, that comes out of that is this change. It hasn't reached every pew, it hasn't <laughs> reached every congregation or church, but we see this this you know generational thing now coming for two or three generations and how it is starting to impact even ordinary Christians. Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Look to, forward to hearing more from you. Likewise. Claire Fan from the University of the Holy Land. Yes. Lovely to meet you, Gidon. Thank you so much and Bob. Thank you.